I'm one of sorry. My name's Mayor. I'm one of the um, co-leaders for this year. With us moderating, we have Kitty Wong, um, who's the co-founder for the Access the AFP course, and pre presenting today is Leon Delaney and AFP AF1 in South Yorkshire. So do you want to take it? Yeah, sure. Thanks very much, Mayor and Kitty. Um, so yeah, as um, Mayor's mentioned, I'm a research AF1 in South Yorkshire. Um, so we'll be doing my research block next year. Um, but just before we start today, um, I have to say that the kind of things we're talking about, it's based on you know my experiences alone and the experiences of other members of the Access the AFP team um, and our friends. You know, it's not endorsed by any you know, you know the University of Bristol or the University of Sheffield that I'm a part of. Um, you know, it's just based on our own experiences. So um, today, you know, you're, you're going to be on the third block by now at the, the interview stage. Um, we'll have this talk today and then I believe there's another talk next week on the academic and personal aspects of the interview. Um, and then there'll be some mock interviews after that, I believe. So today we're going to be focusing mainly on the clinical aspects of your um, AFP interview. Um, and that's kind of mainly focused around the assessment of the unwell or deteriorating patient. Um, so even though you're applying to a research post, it's really important to focus a lot of time on this station because the examiners will be looking to make sure that you're safe doctors first and foremost. Additional emphasis will be put on this because a lot of the posts you're taking will be taking like four months out or even eight months out in some posts out of clinical time. Um, and so at the end of the day, your role as a clinician is going to take priority. So they need to know that you're going to be like, extra safe on the wards. Um, because you just have that little bit less clinical time than you know the standard FP uh, or foundation uh, program trainees. Um, and if you have any questions as we go along, um, I think Mayor and Kitty will be watching the Q and A box. So just feel free to post any questions you have, and, and then we can um, go through them at the end. We've got some question time set aside. So to just talk a bit about kind of the structure of the clinical station. Um, it's very difficult to say, you know, completely what the structure is going to be because it's completely dependent on the deaneries that you're applying to. Um, and I think this, you know, we've got a few screenshots here from different AFP, uh, different deanery websites, just demonstrating, you know, their, um, you know, things about their stations that they host. So I think the most important thing to say is that all of us giving these talks will have only had, you know, an experience of a maximum of two of the two of the interviews. Um, and the deaneries may change their criteria or their formats every year. So it's really important not to rely on what you hear at talks like today or, um, or you know, on forums or anything like that as kind of gospel. It's really important to try and do a bit of your own research and, and find out because they may be changing year on year. Um, I remember really struggling to find any information at all on the interview panels or the structures of the interviews. Um, and I was like looking through the student room, like, and it was really unhelpful just going through the student room forums from like 2016, thinking like, or oh, what, you know, what, anything to get ahead or, or like try and help myself in the interview. But um, that's kind of just a waste of time, to be honest. So try and do a bit of research, find out the exact format of the interviews if you can. Um, UK FPO are usually quite bad at streamlining all this information. Uh, and a lot of it can be hidden in obscure corners of the deanery pages or, you know, websites of the universities that are hosting the academic trainees. So just have a look around and hopefully I, I, you know, I've tried to signpost a few places that you can look. Um, so I think, you know, the most important thing to say at the start here is, you know, this station this, um, is all about practice. So practicing doing the A to E in different ways. So some you, uh, some deaneries may you know, ask you to rattle through the A2E all in one go um, and other deaneries may interrupt you throughout um, and give you more information or change the scenario or something. So, you know, when you're practicing, practice doing this A2E and, and speaking it in different ways um, or practice with a friend and, and interrupt each other and, and all that sorts of thing. Just make sure you're, you're comfortable doing it in different ways so you don't get thrown off if it's not quite what you expect. Um, so yeah, I mean, just to give you an idea about some of the places you can look to find information about the AFP in general. Um, so the Access the AFP website has got um, a lot of good information that's been collated by um, the Access the AFP team. So you can have a look there. 
There's also a new website that's just been released pretty recently, which is CATCH or the Clinical Academic Training and Careers Hub. Um, I think it's possibly more aimed towards postgraduate academic, but there is some information on there, um, but it's brand new. So, I, you know, there might not be that much about the AFP, um, but worth having a look anyway. And then kind of the two main areas where you might expect to see some information on the clinical station or the interviews, if, if there are, is there is any, is on your postgraduate university website um, or um, like the NHS health education websites. And I've just kind of put screenshots of the two ones from, from Sheffield because that's you know what I know, but um, those are the kind of headline um or places that you'll you'll maybe find the information if they have do publish it some places won't publish anything at all and some places publish really clearly what their guidance is so it's you know try and have a look at the places you're applying to um and if you really can't find anything um in my experience it's good to just try and email the deaneries and ask um usually they're good at responding or they were in my experience anyway um and if you do know some people who have applied to the deaneries before they can be good sources of information but you know, it's important to remember, as I said, that these things change um, and the information that you might be given by previous trainees is, is like, could be out of date. So it's best to try and get in contact with the program organizers or coordinators for program specific information. Um, and they, their emails are usually listed on the program website. So just have a look on there. Um, and even if at the end of the day, you can't find much information, you can be fairly sure that there will be some sort of assessment of your A2E. Um, so it's really important to focus on it. And even if it's not, it's, you know, it's good practice for finals. Um, so now to talk a bit about um, how I practice for my AFP interviews. I think for this station, the clinical station, preparation really just comes down to repetition. Um, in terms of knowledge, your clinical emergencies chapter of the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine is more than enough information to see you through the station. Um, the pages have loads of algorithms that distill the management down really simply. Um, and, you know, these are all the key conditions that you'll be most likely asked in your interview and also will be most likely seeing on the wards when you start working. So this is the content to focus on, you know, just that one clinical emergencies chapter. You don't have to learn all of Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine for this interview anyway. Um, and then I think the most important thing really, I had a couple of friends who were also applying for the AFP. So we made a little group and came up with scenarios ourselves. And then we got together and just practiced repeatedly running through the A3 assessment and talking over the basic treatment. Um, and this really helps cement the whole process in your mind. Um, Repeat practice is the only thing that's going to ensure that you don't forget key parts of the assessment when you feel slightly flustered in the exam scenario or even on the wards, you know, when you're seeing an unwell patient. Um, I'd say chronic management is slightly less important because this is something that's usually going to be initiated by seniors. So it's something that will be focused on less by the examiners. However, you know, you may get asked about it. So it's good information to have in the back of your mind. Um, and, you know, if you can reel off chronic management of certain conditions that you're seeing then you know that might elevate you above other interviewees um and then we'll talk a bit more about this at the end but it's also useful to have a think about ethical scenarios for managing certain conditions um you'll never be able to cover every ethical scenario that will come up but it's good to be in the mindset of thinking about how you'd go about answering a question about ethics um and just being aware of the types of questions that might come up so you're not completely thrown off if they give you a curveball or something like that so um but we uh, i'll talk a bit more about that towards the end of the of the talk um so here's kind of a suggested topic list um and a few you know useful resources as i've mentioned the oxford handbook is the the key one um past medicine and hospital or local guidelines um i can't, can't stress enough that saying things like I would refer to local guidelines is a really good thing to just have in the back of your mind as a phrase to say um, when you're doing treatments of in things of these conditions. So um, just wanted to highlight here that's, you know, slightly different to all the rest is the capacity assessment. It might be something that comes up. Again, it's more of an ethicsy thing, um, but it might be tagged on to the end of a scenario that you're given. Um, you know if a patient's refusing care or something if they change the scenario in the middle of, of it so um, just be aware of you know how you'd go about doing a capacity assessment or something like that so um 
I'm just going to, the way I'll, I'll structure this, you know, I'm going to give you a few tips. I think everyone has been, who is probably here, has been had A to E assessments drilled into them by their medical school. It's always useful to go over it again, but um, I don't want to labour it too much just because I think we've all done it, you know, uh, you, you'll all have done it quite a few times. So um, I, I'll try and give some tips of how I go about approaching the A to E and, you know, some helpful things that might might improve um or make you feel more confident in the interview um so i think you don't need to be able to recite every algorithm word for word and you don't need to be able to nail the doses of every medication you'd be given giving um although it does look impressive if you can do this but you know it's it's not you, you can always look it up so they're not going to be expecting you to know the doses off by heart um as i mentioned before what you need to be able to do is demonstrate that you'd be a safe f1 doctor and to do that it's important to understand what the actual role of an f1 is and the role of the f1 is to gather information to initiate basic treatment and then alert someone more senior so that they can use the information you've gathered to make more complex decisions about ongoing care so that will be your role and that will be your role in the interview you're not going to be asked to be a registrar in your in this scenario you're given you know you're going to be an f1 or even a medical student so you need to act within those boundaries basically um, and that's ordering basic investigations and doing a basic assessment nothing more complex than that um i think you know it's always useful to, as i said it's always useful to go over the a to e assessment again and everyone's got their own slightly different spin on it um, the way I find useful to think about the assessment is, you know, at every stage you're looking, looking, listening and feeling and then investigating and treating if you find something wrong in your basic assessment. Um, it's good to have some sort of generic statement that you can use at the start, regardless of what the case is. So you might say something like, you know, I'm worried that this patient is unwell and requires a formal assessment um, in an A to E format. And if you say something like that, it can you know, help settle some of the nerves you might be feeling and give you a bit of extra time to think about what you're going to do. Um, and I think especially in an exam scenario, particularly like a stilted exam over Zoom or a stilted interview over Zoom, having some acronyms that you can fall back on to jolt your memory is really useful. So something like the A to E, but also I'll mention a few more that I've used in the past um, in A to E assessments and things like that. Um, and you can come up with your own if you find it more useful. Some interviews may require you to triage patients based on a few scenarios um, and you may be asked to explain which patient you'd like to see first and why. Um, you might be told that some patients have certain news scores and it's important to get a breakdown of what they're scoring for so that you can identify which patients should be seen first. For example, you know, one patient might be saturating at 80% and another's dropped their blood pressure and you'd, you know, use your A to E and you'd say that, oh, I'll see the patient saturating at 80% first because B is a more Im imminent risk to life than C. Um, so that's a good way of thinking about things if you are asked to triage patients. But it's also good to know, you know, if you've been asked to see multiple patients at once, you can ask other members of staff to do things at the same time while you're seeing one patient. So, you know, you can get someone to take an ECG or take blood or check blood glucose while you're seeing the more ill patient or something like that. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned before, following local trust guidelines is a really good kind of statement to have a good tip you know especially if you can't remember the specific antibiotics or something like that it's going to be different like everywhere compared to where you've trained anyway so you can always say you know i'll look it up in the local trust guidelines um because you know they're not gonna they don't expect you and when you're on the wards you're not going to be just going off it off the top of your head you, you'll always be looking it up anyway um and then just a couple more things i'd say before we go through the a to b um be ready to interpret any investigation that you ask for. So you're only going to be asking for quite simple investigations um, anyway. And the examiners might, um, in the interview, give you, you know, a copy of one of the investigations that you've asked for. So that might be, you know, a chest X-ray or an ECG or an ABG. Um, so make sure you're comfortable just, you know, systematically going through those and, and um, talking about them. And then finally, something that they really like to ask um, is to know some of the scoring systems for, you know, for these um, suggested or the common clinical scenarios. So, you know, the, the Glas Glasgow Blatchford score for bleeding or the Glasgow score for pancreatitis, those sort of things. Just, you know, be able to um, know the names. I don't think you need to you know, calculate the scores off the top of your head, but um, it's good to know to be aware of those, those scoring systems. Okay, so um, 
we'll just go through you know how to do an ATB. I'll try and make it a bit interactive just so everyone's not getting really really bored um, and we won't labor it too much but um, I always like to get a really quick history at, at the top as long as the patient's you know not clearly peri-arrest or struggling for an airway um, if the patient's able to communicate with you it's good to to get a really quick history like 30 seconds before you start the assessment um, you know it might be from the patient or it might be in conjunction with a nurse who's been looking after the patient because often you'll be called to see patients who you've never met before in the middle of the night so sometimes a quick fire set of questions like in the sample acronym can be a good way of getting a quick snapshot of what's going on um, and then you can take a full history at a later point if necessary but you know if you find out what symptoms the patient's been having what allergies they have what medications they take their past medical history the last time they've eaten or drunk anything and what happened in the lead up to this um, you know, deterioration, that will give you a, a basic idea of what's going on and you can go from there. Um, and it's good information to pass on when you're doing your SBAR to your seniors at a later point. So um, if we just, yeah, start with the airway, I guess. Um, and I'll, I'll just ask a few questions and feel free to type in the chat. Um, and I think Mayor and Kitty are monitoring the chat so they can, kind of say whatever you guys have been saying um so if you start with the you know the look listen feel um what what do you guys think the signs of of a patent airway would be Come on, guys, type your answers in the chat. Uh, that's all right. Um, people might be a bit shy. That's fine. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, the kind of signs of your patient airway is like people, uh, someone, if a patient's talking or if the patient's alert and sat up, or um, if you can see, you know, misting on the mask or something like that. Basically, any ability to produce syllables usually means that the airway is safe. Um, so, that's quite an easy assessment to make. Um, and then can anyone kind of tell me any signs of airway compromise that we might see in an unwell patient? We've got stridal. Yeah, good. Silent airway, someone said. Yeah. Snoring or gurgling. Yeah, perfect. So, um, Really, yeah, snoring and gurgling uh, is a good one and quite an, an obvious one that often comes up in, in exam scenarios. Um, stridor is more of a sign of upper airway obstruction and then you've got something like wheeze, which might be a sign of lower airway obstruction. Um, and then you might have a look in the mouth as well and you can see some, some visible debris or you know complete silence as well. Um, and then, so our ways of treating um, you know, a compromised airway are gonna be, um, Usually you just stick them on oxygen um, uh, regardless in this sort of scenario when they're, they're unwell with that, without an airway. Um, and then you, you might want to use um, movements like a head tilt chin lift or a jaw thrust or something like that. Um, and then you've got your airway adjuncts uh, like a nasopharyngeal airway or an oropharyngeal airway or, or Gidal. Um, and then obviously you've got, you know, if you can see visible secretions in the mouth, then you can use suction or something like that. Um, does anyone know what would be kind of a contraindication for using either an airway adjunct, like a nasopharyngeal airway or head tilt chin lift? We've got C-spine injury and base of skull fracture. Yeah, perfect. So um, if, you, if you've got someone who you think has got a C-spine injury, then you're not going to use a head, a, a head tilt chin lift. You, you want to keep a more neutral airway, um, spine. So you're going to use a jaw thrust for that. And then, um, yeah, if, if, someone, if you think someone's got a, a facial trauma or skull fracture, then you're not going to use a nasopharyngeal airway. Um, and then I'd say at this point, you know, if anyone's got any problems with their airway, then... Um, you're going to need help from seniors. You know, it's usually these um, adjuncts are something that are temporary fixes um, and they're not going to solve the problem. And, you know, a lot of these patients are going to need permanent airways 
So you're going to want some help from an anaesthetist or something like that. So you can call for help or you can dial, uh, call 2222 or pull the emergency cardiac arrest button if you think the patient's really unwell. Um, no one's going to be annoyed at you for that. Okay, great. So um, an, an important thing to say here as well, um, if you do notice that something is wrong in the parameters that you're assessing, don't move on until you've made some sort of change um, and then gone back to the start to reassess. So um, you always want to make sure that you've implemented some sort of management to help address the issues that you've noticed before you continue on. Um, and then just a small caveat to that is, you know, when we're taught A to B assessments, it's told in a very rigid and vertical way. I like do A, do the B and then do C, which is done so that we can have a fixed framework so that we can fall back on this in a stressful situation. But in reality, when we assess the unwell patient, a lot of these things happen in a horizontal way at the same time. Um, and, you know, it can take a lot of uh, a small while for these things to take effect. So giving a stat bolus of fluid isn't just going to happen instantaneously. It will take a few minutes to set up and be run through. So you can do other parts of the assessment while this is happening. Um, and there might also be other people around to help you. Um, but to be clear, kind of in, a, in an online exam or in uh, interview scenario, make it clear that you're not going to move on with your assessment until you've made a change and put in some form of, of management and then gone back to assess from the start of A2E to see if it's having the effect. So um, for our breathing, you don't need to perform a full respiratory exam. You only need to assess the key measures that will help you look at whether there's been an acute deterioration with the patient's breathing. Um, if you notice anything wrong with B, then perform the investigations, initiate some management and then reassess. So our key observations for, um, for the breathing section are just the respiratory rate and the SATs. Um, and then we can do a look, listen and feel kind of quick assessment of, um, of our breathing. So you know, that's going to be looking for any peripheral or central cyanosis, um, looking for any accessory muscle, accessory muscle use, uh, looking for the position of the trachea, any chest expansion, and then having a listen and feel of the chest. Um, so you can work your way centrally to peripherally, if, oh, sorry, peripherally to centrally um, uh, to kind of you know, get all these things in, but you don't need to do a full respiratory exam. And then if you do notice anything wrong with any of the things you've you've been investigating or assessing, then there are two key respiratory investigations that you'd want to do, which are an AVG and a chest X-ray. And it's worth getting these in anyone who you think has problems with, with their B. Um, so anyone who's got increased um, respiratory rate or decreased SATs, just it's worth saying that you'd get these. Um, obviously a chest X-ray isn't something that's gonna happen instantaneously, but an AVG is a really good way to give you a picture of the oxygenation um, and that sort of thing. Um, and again, just a caveat with the chest X-ray, you know, if you think someone has a tension pneumothorax, this is a clinical diagnosis and it needs immediate senior support and drainage. So you can't wait around to get a chest X-ray for that. But in most other scenarios, you've got time or you, you can order a chest X-ray and it might happen now or um, later, depending on how unwell you think the patient is. And just finally, um, for our management part of B, um, so Usually we'd start with a 15 litre non rebreathe mask in the acutely unwell patient. Um, what, what do you guys think we should do if we have a patient with known COPD? Someone said still give 15 litres. Yeah, that's right. Um, so in your acute acute phase, you know, if a patient's acutely unwell, hypoxia is always going to kill someone more quickly than hypercapnia. Um, so generally speaking, you're going to want to use um, 15 litres, um, whether they have COPD or not. Um, and if you think they might be a risk of retaining, so, you know, some patients you might know that they've previously, you know, they, they might be a known retainer um, or, you know, they might have have got a history that tells you that they have really severe COPD and they might be a retainer. Um, in these scenarios, you'd still probably give 15 litres um, of non rebreathe oxygen and titrate, you know, and then take an ABG, see if they're retaining, and then you can titrate down later if you need to. Um, 
but I'd usually say that wait, you know, you can wait for senior support before titrating the oxygen down because this is you, you've got time, um, time to do that. Whereas hypoxia is much more um, of a threat to life um, in these cases. And then if you think um, a patient's not uh, ventilating themselves adequately, so you know they might have a respiratory of six or something, or uh, really shallow breaths, then you might want to use a bag valve mask instead. Um, because a non rebreathe mask is not going to be enough to support their ventilation. Um, it only enhances the oxygen intake. So in patients who aren't ventilating properly, you need to use a bag valve mask and ventilate them at about 10 to 15 breaths per minute. Um, and then if you're doing this, you're going to need to call for help because the patient need, may need escalation of breathing support to your non-invasive ventilations, um, CPAP or BiPAP or something like that. And then further management beyond that is very much dependent on what the cause of the illness is. And, um, you know, there are many different causes and it's not possible to go through them in a talk like this. That's the sort of information that you'll get from your clinical emergencies section. Um, and then, um, but you know, it might be something like steroids and nebulizers for asthma um, or something like that. Okay, so just to move on now to circulation. So our key observations are gonna be heart rate, blood pressure, and um, temperature can sometimes be included in this one, you know, if you're thinking about sepsis. Um, and then fluid balance is a really important one. So it's not, you know, really included in the news score, but it's a really important to get a picture of the urine output um, because, and, and fluid monitoring should be put in place for any acutely unwell patient. Um, a, an important thing to say about blood pressure is that it's a very late sign. The body's very good at compensating via various mechanisms such as RAS or the or antidiuretic hormone. So it's important to try and catch hypovolemia um, or distributive shock or something like that before it gets to the point that the patient's hypotensive. So heart rate and respiratory rate are really sensitive markers that tend to go off before the blood pressure does. Um, and then our look, listen, feel, you know, we're looking for capillary refill time. But again, um, capillary refill time, you know, might be normal in an unwell patient. In someone who's got sepsis or distributive shock, the capillary refill time can be normal until very late. So don't kind of just think, oh, because the patient's CRT is normal, that they're fine. Um, You'd also want to look at the patient's temperature and the color of their skin. You know, is there any pallor, um, the pulse, rhythm, rate and strength, um, and then have a listen to the heart sounds and feel for any edema. And again, it's just a really quick assessment, not a full cardiovascular exam, just giving yourself the basic information to see what the patient's circulatory state is. Um, and then our key investigations, if you like, for, um, for circulation are going to be um, an ECG, um, for anyone who's tachycardic really, or I mean, you can really do an ECG on anyone who's acutely unwell. Um, and then, you know, you want to put in two, two large bore cannula, cannulae, um, and then get a set of, of bloods. Um, and it's good to be able to justify whatever bloods you're asking for, but you're never going to be wrong asking for a full blood count, using these LFTs, glucose, lactate, and a coag, um, and getting blood cultures as well. You know, they're going to be pretty relevant in any scenario that you're doing in an A to B. Um, if you think the patient's bleeding, you might want to get a group and save or a cross match. Um, and it's always good to get a VBG as well to give yourself more instant results. Um, but again, further, um, further bloods like amylase or something like that might be dependent on what you think is going on. Um, does anyone know what we might do in a scenario where we can't get any um, IV access? Someone suggested IO. Yeah, great. So um, IO is um, a good way of getting really quick access. You should only really have it in for about 24 hours, but it's usually on most wards. Um, you can, it, it's quite simple to put in. Um, you don't really get trained. At, well, so, um, I certainly didn't get trained in, in med school to do it, but um, it's, it's quite easy. You can put it in the tibia or in the humerus um, and you can take bloods off it sometimes and you can give fluids and, and drugs in the way you'd give IV. Um, so that's a good, um, a good way of um, getting access if you can't get any IV access in the heat, like in, in a, 
acute scenario. Um, so our kind of key management for circulation, fluid is the most important one. Um, usually we'd give 250 or 500 ml bolus over three to five minutes using a pressure bag to give it as fast as possible. And then you reassess to see if the blood pressure is gonna improve with the fluids. Um, it's always important to reassess after you've given the fluids to make sure that the patient's not becoming overloaded, especially in someone with renal um, impairment or someone with um, um, heart failure or something like that, or in an elderly patient. Um, and then you can give up to two liters. And if not responding to this, you're gonna need some senior help because they might need critical care input for vasopressors or inotropes or something like that. But that's again, not something that you expected to put in as an F1 vasopressors or inotropes. Um, and then the sepsis six is a, is a really good way um, of making sure that you've you've covered all the bases. Um, I think the sepsis six is appropriate in any of these scenarios, whether you think they've got sepsis or not, because sepsis can uh, um, present in so many different ways. Um, and the new score will say to initiate the sepsis pathway for any score above five, or if the patient's scoring more than three in any parameter. Um, and Buffalo is a good acronym to remember the sepsis six, but usually most of these have already been done by this point anyway. So you've usually already give, taken bloods, um, check the urine output, given fluids, um, and then you know, you'll already have taken a lactate and, and given some oxygen. The only thing you might not have done at this point is to give antibiotics. So um, you can refer to you can you can refer to your trust guidelines. Um, or you can try and remember specific antibiotics like Kefmet and Gent for abdominal sepsis or something like that. But again, you know, it's going to be different, slightly different depending on where you are. So it's good to just say, I'd refer to the trust guidelines for doses and, and um, types of antibiotic. And then again, the, the specific management will be based on your knowledge from the Oxford Handbook. Um, and then just finally, kind of the last couple, um, disability you're looking at three, it's just blood glucose, temp, uh, pupils and temperature if you've not already done it. Um, and then it's always, you know, I think everyone always stresses this, but don't forget glucose because it's um, a really easy fix. Um, so you can give IV dextrose or IM glucagon if the patient doesn't have IV access. And then again, look at the pupils because if they're pinpoint um, and the resps are low, then it's likely that they've got, you know, um, they've overdosed on, on morphine or opioids. And it's a really common scenario to come up in these A2Es um, because the patients are, you know, often come out of surgery and on lots of painkillers or something like that. Um, and then, you know, you can give warm fluids or blankets if the patient's slightly cold or um, beyond this, if you, you, you can order further investigations if the GCS is low or ADPU is, um, slightly off but things like a CT head are something you consider but usually is not something you're going to order without running it past a senior and then finally just our exposure so everything else basically um, doing an abdominal exam and um, checking the carb is always a good one and then the PR exam if you think it's relevant so the patient's bleeding or got some abdominal pain or something like that um, skin changes, looking for rashes or swelling or cellulitis or any cause that might be causing a spike in temp. Um, any bleeds um, from, from wounds or into drains that might cause hypovolemia. Um, and then any sites of iatrogenic infection, so a catheter, an epidural um, or a drain. You always want to you know, say you'd take swabs from these um, or things like that. Okay, so just a few kind of finishing touches um, that I like or liked to um, kind of think about when I was doing my um, interviews and, and exam scenarios. Um, I was always a bit confused about, you know, knowing when to escalate in, because sometimes you get to be and you've, you feel kind of stuck and um, but you think, oh, but well, I'm only a B and I've not done the rest of my um, assessment. So I can I escalate at this point. Um, I'd say, to know that you can escalate at whatever point you feel uncomfortable and you feel like you've run out of things that you can personally do. So if you've done your airway adjuncts and the patient's not improving, or if you just start holding the patient's airway, you need to call for help. Um, if the patient's um, sats aren't improving and you've given them 15 liters of oxygen, you need to call for help. So anytime you feel that you're not, you're not comfortable, um, it's really fine 
the pe people would rather you just call for help um, because your job as an F1 is not to fix everyone. Um, so you can pull the Perry arrest buzzer or you can put out a double two, uh, two, 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 um, and um, that's completely fine. Um, and then it's important to be comfortable with performing short, concise S bars to hand over to the senior colleagues. So there's a good chance you'll be asked to do one in your interview. Um, so, you know, practice doing these with your friends. Um, it doesn't have to be long or complicated, just the key headline points. Um, and, you know, I think the most important thing is at the top, say what you want the senior to do so you get their attention to like, I'd really like your input on this patient or I'd really like you to kind of review what I've done. Um, because I'm worried about this patient or something like that. Um, and just an acronym, again, just for some of the additional tests. So a lot of these have already been done, but you might, you know, you might forget in the heat of the moment. Um, so I think it's nice to just have an acronym to remember and, you know, make sure you've, you've got all the important tests. So your bloods and then orifice tests, you know, if it's a, um, a young woman with abdominal pain, you're going to want to get a pregnancy test or um, you know, a, a sputum sample or a catheter swab or something like that. Um, and then x-rays and ECG, pretty self-explanatory and special tests, um, you know, things like CTs, but again, usually something that you're not going to be doing without senior input, um, but good to have an idea, you know, because the examiner might say, you know, what would you think you should do next? Um, Something else that's good to do is just, you know, talk about medications or talking about medication reviews, because a lot of the time you might be asked about a patient who's had a fall or something like that. And it might be that they're usually on multiple um, antihypertensives or something. And so it's always good to say that you'd want to review their medications to make sure they're not on anything that can be causing the symptoms they've, have, they've been having. Uh, and then after that, you know, it's just kind of tidying up. So you'll take a full history in some cases, you wanna make sure the patient's pain and nausea is under control. And then you just wanna document everything you've done, the fact that you've escalated and you know any further escalation points for, for the nursing staff or whoever's looking after the patient. Okay, so that's kind of the end of the A to E. Um, and then I've just got an example here. Um, so we'll just rattle through this because we don't want to labour the point too much, but this is an example of something you might be given. So um, you're the F1 and A&E, you've been asked to review a 32 year old lady who's been brought into who's been brought in by ambulance um, and you've got the following observations. Um, so a news of nine for a high respirate, um, low SATs on oxygen, um, blood pressure slightly on the low side, but not too bad, um, slightly tacky and a slight um, temperature. So I think as soon as you've been given your scenario, you're usually going to have some sort of idea of what's been going on because that's what the news score is good for is highlighting an area where the patient might be not doing so well. So here um, you're thinking the rest and the sats aren't looking too good. And in a young woman, you might think, oh, it could be asthma. So, um, you know, you can take a quick history there to see, um, you know, if she's able to talk to you, if she's got, if she's feeling well enough you can take a quick history, see if she's got a background of asthma, see if she takes any asthma meds or anything like that. Um, so you do your A to E, um, airways patent, able to talk, but only a few words at a time. Um, I'd say asthma is a really common one to come up and it's really good to know the severity criteria. Um, so knowing, you know, what does able to complete four sentences mean versus able to complete a few words at a time because they like asking those sort of things um, where there are set categories, you know, it's a, an easy way to quiz you on your knowledge. Um, so if we do our B here, it's kind of the main one, you know, the patient's looking tired, using accessory muscles to breathe, respiratory rate 26, SATs 94%. Um, and I think this is to highlight the point of, you know, knowing when to escalate because you're only at your B here, but I'd already be starting to worry about this patient because if she's tiring um, and using accessory muscles, then things can um, deteriorate really, really quickly with asthma. Um, and you know, they, they might need really senior input. So it's always good to, to let someone know what's going on um, if you're feeling uncomfortable with the scenario. Um, and then you know, I see um, it's, it's pretty, pretty normal. Um, you might be given an ECG to interpret. So make sure you're, you're comfortable with doing that. Um, and then, our, our D, 
um, which is slight tachy, uh, slight, sorry, slight temperature, um, and RE um, is fine. So, um, just to go through, you know, a few differentials. Asthma is going to be the top one. Um, COVID, I think, um, you know, it, it might be worth being aware just because COVID has been around for so long now, you know, you might ask questions about it. So have a bit of an awareness and be able to talk about it a little bit. I think it's probably quite a good idea because they might want, they might put it in somehow. Um, and then other, these other uh, differentials, maybe not so likely. Um, but can anyone just throw out some, some kind of, initial management plans that we might um might want to be doing for this this young woman so be more nebulizers someone said Okay, yeah, so yeah, you'd um, definitely be wanting to do oxygen and nebulized albutamol. Um, and yeah, I've seen a few more. So um, ipitropium and IV hydrocortisone, yeah, good. Um, so depending on how unwell the patient is, you can give oral or IV steroids. Um, and then you might, you know, give antibiotics in this scenario and take cultures to cover because there was a slight pyrexia, um, which you can then stop later. Um, but then, yeah, I think the main thing here is just to know that senior input will be required urgently um, and, you, you know, continue, uh, consider contacting ITU or critical care outreach or someone like that, because asthma can deteriorate really quickly and require quite intensive um, management. So, um, yeah. And then, um, yeah, just some of the investigations that, that you'd perform, but you'd, you'd get these done through your A2E. Um, and then, yeah, here, so you might, you know, if you, if you get a patient with, with respiratory um, issue, issues, you might ask for an ABG and then you might be given an ABG in the middle of your scenario. They might cut you off to give it or they might give it to you at the end. But just, you know, be, um, have a good way, a systematic way of going through an ABG and just, you know, be able to talk about them. So, you know, here we've got a raised PCO2 and a, uh, and a low PO2. So, um, this is, you know, a picture of type two respiratory failure, uh, and obviously in asthma, someone with a normal or a raised CO two is is someone that you're really worried about, and it's a sign of life threatening asthma. So if you're seeing this, you're calling for help straight away. Um, and then I just kind of wanted to highlight a few other types of question that could be asked in these, um, you know, A two E kind of clinical scenarios. So I think the A two E bit is by far the most important part and the bit that you're going to be quizzed on the most because as I said they want to make sure you're safe but um you know they might they can also ask you things like long-term management of asthma so or long-term management of anything so you know that's going to be something that will come from the Oxford handbook stuff um and then you know questions about specific meds or um you know maybe how how will this differ in adult versus pediatric or um you know other things like public health um, sort of questions can come up as well. Um, I, I, so I think when you're practicing, focus most of your time on making sure you've got the A to E down because that's the most important bit. But don't, but like be aware that you, you might get asked other things as well around that and they might um, kind of throw curveballs at you. So just be expecting that because I think that's, you know, the most important thing is that if you're expecting that some other type of question might come up, then, you know, you can, you'll have time to think about it in, in the scenario and they don't want you to know the answers to everything. They just want to see that you can think through these things. Um, so they don't expect you to know, you know, everything. They don't expect you to be experts in, in any of these conditions that we're talking about. And then finally, just a few other you know, types of non-clinical so much question that might come up. So you might get asked questions about um, ethics. So, you know, it might be something like um, someone who's come in and you've done the A to E and their hemoglobin is really low and you need to give them blood, but they've refused it. I think that's a really common thing and something that happens much more in exams than in real life. Um, but, you know, you need to have a framework for addressing 
um, ethical issues around, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses and blood products or um, Gillick and Fraser competence or things like that. Um, and, you know, other things that might come up are, you know, dealing with patients compl patient complaints or how to deal with errors that you've made or that a member of the team has made or something like that, or dealing with an angry patient. Um, and, you know, when, when being asked the questions, I don't think, you know, never be afraid to say that you're going to ask someone more senior and with more experience for advice, because that is what you'll do in real life. You're not expected to know everything, you're not expected to be an expert. Um, and like showing the examiner that you've got the kind of um, a, like self-awareness to know your own limitations is a really important skill to have um, and a really important skill as an F1. So don't, you know, it's a good thing to show that you know when to ask for help. Um, and yeah, here are just a couple of you know, things you can look at in terms of answering ethical questions, good medical practice, um, that sort of thing. Um, is what most of our ethical guidance when we're talking about these questions is based on. So um, maybe have a look at that, um, but I wouldn't worry about it too much. And then just finally, um, some kind of top tips, um, final tips. So it's very easy to say, don't panic. Um, and I'm sure I was told not to panic and then I did panic. Um, but, you know, I think it's in a lot of people's nature to, to be worried about these things, but um, at the end of the day, the examiners aren't expecting you to know any, everything. Uh, it doesn't matter if you forget like small things. Um, you'll already likely have most of the knowledge that you need to ace this part of the interview. Um, the most important thing is being confident enough to express this and like be fluent with your structure so that you can gather the information in a systematic way so that you can then relay it on to someone else. So I think make sure you know it like a script make sure you've got it in your head and you just you can say it without thinking your a to b like make sure you know exactly what you all the parameters that you need to assess um so that you're not thinking oh what comes next what comes next you need to be thinking oh what does it mean now this patient's got um a raised um respiratory rate or whatever you know you don't want to be focusing on thinking about the a to b um and if you do get stuck you'll never be wrong saying that you want to phone a senior um or like for advice or to run your plan by them um this makes you look safer it makes you look more aware of your own limitations um and you'll also never be wrong by saying that you're going to go back to the beginning and start your a to b again um if something changes with the patient's condition or if you perform any sort of in intervention or if you start running out of assessments or you feel flustered just go back to the start and redo it and you won't be wrong um and yeah, I think just finally, just make sure you practice saying it out loud rather than in your head. Um, or, I mean, in your head as well, but make sure you know how to say it out loud. Um, but those are kind of all the tips I have, um, and I'm sure you guys will all smash it. Um, and now, you know, if anyone has any questions, I think there's some been coming into the chat. So please feel free to put them in. Um, we'll all be around um, us to answer any questions you guys have. Um, and if you wouldn't mind just filling out the post um, post slideshow feedback um, just to let us know and kind of help us improve for future because this is the first one of these that I've ever done. So it'd be good to get some feedback. But thanks very much for you all for coming. Sorry, thank you, Liam. That was a really, really good talk. Um, we've got a few minutes for questions. So if we type any more questions in the Q&A box and we'll try and answer them live. Um, so we've just got a few questions from the pre-course questionnaire first. Uh, the first one is, how do you make your clinical station response stand out? Um, that's a good question. Um... I'd say they're not looking for someone as, as silly as it seems. They're not looking for someone who's going to stand out in terms of the clinical station, because um, this is something that's been drilled into all of us so much. So you're more likely to stand out by not knowing it than, you know, you're more likely to stand out in the wrong way, I think. So just, you know, make sure you're really comfortable doing it. Um, and, you know, there might some, you know, the ways to stand out, I suppose, are to know the doses of the medications uh, and to be able to just kind of get all of those things and just say them really quickly um, and just have them roll off the tongue, like the doses of the medications um, and all the kind of little details. So 
if those if you can remember those things and that's really great and that will make you stand out um but i think it's really important just to focus on being able to do this comfortably rather than knowing the doses of the medications and that sort of thing i don't know if you if kitty or may i have any additional um ideas about that question yeah i would just say um being confident in your ate is again hugely important but at the end of the day they're looking for someone who's going to be safe um and they just want you to create some differentials and treat the imminent issues um so just being confident in your answers and the best way to do that is through practicing or practicing in the mirror yeah i agree and just one final thing is like i think leah mentioned at the start is remembering that you're entering most of these scenarios as an f1 so i think earlier when we were talking about what would you do if you didn't have any access and i think someone typed um central line and i think that's obviously can be a correct answer but i think most of the time uh, for most f1s you will not be doing a central line on your own especially not sort of in an ed setting so in that in those sort of scenarios you can say that as a potential solution to the problem but just remember to say oh you know one thing in the future to consider later down the line in this patient's management is getting the anesthetist involved and that they would potentially need a central line um in the future but not saying you know not jumping in and saying i would do a central line as an f1 because that's most of the time a bit unrealistic. Okay, so I think another question that someone asked is, um, how would you prioritize patients? For example, if they gave you three patients who were all acutely unwell? Um, yeah, I think so. The important way to do this is to, um, yeah, use your ATV. So, um, you know, They'll give, I, I don't think they'd be really mean and, and give you patients that are similarly unwell. There'll they'll be ways of differentiating them. So, you know, one patient might have an airway problem or something like that. Um, and then one's got their breathing off and one's got their circulation off or something like that. And, you know, that's the way to triage it is to go with your A to B. A is the most important thing um, to, for keeping people alive. So um, that's the most imminent threat. Um, and then B's next and then C. Um, so that's kind of the way to go about doing it, I think. Um, I think one thing to be aware that might, you know, can trip people up sometimes is is when something appears to be like a D or something like that, but actually is an airway problem. So, you know, if you've got a patient with epilepsy, um, you might it, you might categorize it more as a, as a D, as someone who's having a seizure or something like that or in status epilepticus or something like that, but actually it's a real threat to the airway. So, you know, just, you know, the A to E is the way to triage these things, but just have in the back of your mind that it's not always as simple as kind of, as, as it may seem. Um, and I think, you know, always say that you're gonna make use of the other staff. So direct, you know, it's all about kind of conducting the other staff. So when they've, when they've, ask you just to come and see a patient, give them an idea about how long you might be, and then say, oh, in the meantime, could you do this, this, and this? Um, because that, again, makes sure that you can plan ahead. Um, and it means that you're more ready to see the patients when you actually come and get to them. And just another thing to add on to that, exactly what Liam said in terms of other staff as well. At some hospitals, they might have site practitioners like hospital at night who are site practitioners who can prescribe certain medications. And some of them can also do ultrasound cannulas and things like that. So, you know, just being able to say that, well, if there's such and such people available in the hospital, you probably delegate some tasks. I think that would be a really reasonable answer. Um, okay, and then someone else has asked, would you recommend um, taking a history from the patient before doing your ATE assessment or would you lose marks for not going to the ATE immediately? Uh, I do think you'd lose, I don't think you lose marks for going to it, for not going to the ATE immediately. I think it's very dependent on the scenario um, because having some form of short history can be really helpful in kind of guiding you for, in, in your further assessment um but i think obviously there are certain scenarios where you don't have time to talk to the patient you know if the patient's always at risk you can't ask them questions because a they're not going to respond and b it's an imminent threat to life um but if you're asked to see a patient who's musing because you know their heart rate's up and um their sats are a bit low or something then but they're still you know 
L, um, patent airway and set up an alert and able to talk to you, then getting an idea about why they're in hospital in the first place and you know knowing what allergies they have, those things are all really important because you might do your A to E um, and you might want to give them some antibiotics or something. Um, so you need to know if they've got any allergies or you know you might be thinking about the, does the patient need surgery for a bleed or something like that? Um, and so you need to know, you know, when's the patient last eaten, that sort of thing. Um, but it, you know, it's the sort of thing that takes 20 seconds to run through those, those, um, the kind of sample acronym just to get a really brief overview before you can gather more information later, I'd say. The one thing I would add is also, I guess, taking a history from the patient actually assesses their airway if they can give you a history. Um, so if they're, they're able to talk to you, um, there's no imminent airway issue. And I guess as well, like, um, you know, as I said, it, this is taught to us in a very vertical way, but in reality, you can be assessing someone's, you know, you can be assessing someone and asking them questions at the same time. Um, so these things will happen kind of on a horizontal sort of basis. Cool. And then um, I think we've had a few questions sort of throughout the, the session asking about how to structure um, answers to the ethical questions. And I think, um, Maya, you've been saying using the ethical pillars is a good example. Um, do you want to expand a bit for other people who haven't seen the question? Yeah, of course. So just any sort of ethical scenario, you can go through the four ethical pillars. Um, the first is autonomy, which is the patient's right to decide. Um, so in a scenario where it's Jehovah's Witness, as long as the patient has a has the capacity to make that decision, um, that needs to be respected in that ethical scenario. Um, then you have the principles of non-maleficence to do no harm in your capacity as a doctor. Um, beneficence to provide medications or treatment that's of benefit to the patient and then justice which is the fair distribution of resources um, kind of more globally within a hospital or within a country um, and the best way to tackle ethical scenarios is to kind of consider each of those four pillars and you can even talk through them with the examiner out loud um, and then probably come to some sort of conclusion about what you would do in the scenario, depending on what that is. And just to add on to that, that's a really good answer for any sort of difficult situations to reason with patients. Another structure that you guys can use, um, particularly for like conflicts with your colleagues and stuff like that is something called a spy structure. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but essentially it stands for seeking information first. So for example, if the patient is threatening to self-discharge, you want to ask questions about why they're choosing to do that. And is there any problems that you can just fix immediately? The second one, so P stands for patient safety. So if they're again, going with a self-discharge example, so ensuring that you're giving safety netting advice so that if they deteriorate, they know where to, to get help or, you know, offering to let your seniors know to kind of choose, like, if they're refusing IV antibiotics to stay in the hospital, can you give them any oral antibiotics um, to cover them in the meantime? And then I stands for initiative. So um, basically taking initiative to tackle the problem. So like I said, like giving oral antibiotics instead of IV. Uh, e stands for escalate, so es always escalate to your seniors, um, and it's always basically an appropriate answer for most of these scenarios. Um, and finally, support, so um, ensuring that there are people to support the patient and also people to support yourself in your decision as well. So documenting, making sure there are witnesses to your conversation, making sure there's senior agreement with what you're about to do. Um, Liam, do you have any um, other things to add to that? Um... No, not particularly. That was very thorough. Cool. Any other questions, guys? Do pop them in the q and I think someone asked, um, will we be doing sessions to cover the other aspects of the interview in terms of the academic and personal stuff? So that's going to be our next two webinar sessions, um, which will firstly cover the academic critical appraisal, and then secondly will be about the personal station, which is mostly like talking about your CV. Um, and then after that, we'll run one-to-one -one mock interviews um, for those of you who are going to be interviewed with the AFP or SFP.
Um, someone's asked, are we allowed to write slash make notes during the interview? Um, I think I, that depends a bit on where you yeah, are. Yeah, it's going to depend. I would just, so I was allowed to do that in mine, um, in one of mine anyway. Um, but I think it, you know, just ask at the start. If, you're good, if you want to do it, ask at the start and say, and they'll probably say, you know, show us the piece of paper um, to make sure that it's blank or whatever. <laughs> Um, and then you can kind of just make notes if it if it helps. Um, I did it for mine and then I actually didn't find that it helped me very much because I was conscious that I kept looking down at my sheet of paper and I was like, well, what if they think I'm cheating? So I think at the end of the day, you don't have to retain that much information here. Um, the scenarios they give you are usually quite short. And then when you're doing your A to B, um, you, you know, it's usually small snippets of information that they give you that you don't really, you know, writing down kind of interrupts the flow so yeah, if you feel if you feel like it will help you then um by all means ask at the start and they will just say yes or no um but otherwise you know it, it does completely depend on on the deanery that you're being interviewed at yeah just to add on to that so um when i did my both my interviews um you were allowed to write on some paper for the academic part of the critical appraisal because they usually give you a paper to read or an abstract or whatever and you're allowed to kind of scribble on that if you want i personally found that the interview went by so quickly and was so time stressed anyway that there was no time really to think or write anything down um which is what i personally found um so you know like liam said by all means if you think it will help um you know bring a pen along and, and see if they let you do it but i just think that most of these interviews are so short and time pressured and there's so much to get through I don't think you actually would have time to do that. Well, if there's no more questions, I think we'll wrap it up there. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Uh, could you please fill out the feedback form for Liam in the chat? That would be really, really helpful and gives us great ways to develop the programme in the future and gives Liam really good feedback for his teaching session and the time that he's dedicated today. Um, for the